December 19, 1944. The East China Sea bears witness to the death of the Imperial Japanese Navy's newest, most modern aircraft carrier, the Un Ryu. 17,000 tons of steel and 1,238 lives are swallowed by the ocean in just seven minutes after the fatal blow. It is a horrifying record. But the deadliest irony lies not in the numbers. Deep inside the belly of this ship lies a secret weapon, something the Japanese High Command believes has the power to completely alter the course of the war. Yet, instead of saving the Empire, this weapon has become a traitor. It has turned the mothership into a flaming coffin. What actually happened during those brief moments of destiny? And what exactly was that secret weapon? Let us turn back the clock to the moment before the tragedy began to understand why such a maritime disaster occurred. We must look straight at the naked truth of the Japanese Navy in late 1944. They were dying. After the devastating losses at Midway and the Philippine Sea, the combined fleet, once the terror of the Pacific, was now just a hollow shell. They still had warships, they still had massive guns, but they had lost the heart of modern naval warfare. Skilled pilots. The eagles that once dominated the skies over Pearl Harbor were all dead. Replacing them were green rookies, men who had barely learned how to land on a flight deck without crashing into the sea. In this context of pure desperation, the Un Ryu class was born. Named the Cloud Dragon, she was the lead ship of a new class designed for mass production to save the situation. The Japanese government poured millions of yen and thousands of tons of precious steel into her. The last scraps of resources scraped from an exhausting nation. Technically, the Un Ryu was a masterpiece. Longer than two football fields, equipped with the latest anti-aircraft radar and capable of 34 knots, faster than any submarine of the time. But the flashy exterior could not hide the ugly truth inside. The Un Reis was a sword without a blade. She had no planes. The air groups had been wiped out. She had no fuel. The oil crisis was so severe that this brand new ship didn't even have enough fuel for proper sea trials. Strategically, the Great Cloud Dragon was nothing more than a paper tiger. And this is when the Japanese High Command made perhaps the craziest, most wasteful decision of the war. They decided to turn this state-of-the-art fleet carrier into a cargo ferry. General Douglas MacArthur had returned to the Philippines. The battle for Luzon was raging. The Japanese army in Manila was starving, running out of ammunition, and desperate for reinforcements. The Navy looked at the Un Ryu and said, let's use it to haul supplies. It was a misuse of assets bordering on criminal negligence. Imagine building a multi-million dollar Formula One race car and then using it to deliver groceries. That is exactly the fate of the Un Ryu. But what was loaded into the ship's belly was not just trucks or ordinary shells. Deep in the hangars, strapped down tight, were 30 machines of death, weapons that Japan believed would make the Americans tremble. The Un Ryu's top secret mission was to transport 30 weapons designated MXY-7 to Manila. The Japanese called it Oka, Cherry Blossom, a poetic name symbolizing fleeting beauty and noble sacrifice. But the American soldiers who would later face them called them by a much cruder, more accurate name, the Baka Bomb, the Idiot Bomb. The Oka was not a fighter plane. It was, in reality, a manned cruise missile. Its construction was ruthlessly simple. A cheap plywood body, stubby wings, and three solid fuel rocket engines in the tail. But the most terrifying part was the nose. It carried a massive warhead weighing 1,200 kilograms. To put that in perspective, 
Its explosive power was double that of a heavy torpedo and five times that of a standard aerial bomb. Just one hit could snap the spine of a destroyer or tear open the side of an American carrier. Its operating mechanism was a death sentence for the pilot. A mother plane, usually a Betty bomber, would carry the Oka close to the American fleet. The suicide pilot would climb into the cramped cockpit, bolt the hatch shut with no way out. Once dropped, he would ignite the three rockets. And this is where the difference becomes clear. Unlike the Zero fighters used in standard kamikaze attacks, the Oka was a rocket. In a dive, it reached speeds approaching 1,000 kilometers per hour. At that insane velocity, the manual targeting systems of American anti-aircraft guns at the time were completely useless. Unstoppable, inescapable. The 30 Okas inside the Unreyu were the last hope for Japan to bathe the American fleet in blood at Lingayen Gulf. The logic of the high command was cold. Trade 30 pilot lives for 30 American warships. A very profitable exchange. But they forgot one thing. For this weapon to work, it had to reach the battlefield. And stuffing 30 tons of high explosives into the belly of a ship moving through waters infested with death was an act of suicide. December 17, 1944. The Unryu weighed anchor and left Kure, heading south. The ship was packed tight. The lower decks were jammed with military trucks and mortars. The upper decks were lined with the Oka flying bombs. Captain Ka Name Ko Nishi, a seasoned veteran, knew perfectly well he was sitting on a floating powder keg. The East China Sea was no longer a Japanese lake. It was an American submarine hunting ground. To protect the Unryu, command sent three escort destroyers, Hinoki, Mome, and especially the Shigure. The Shigure was a living legend. Known as the lucky ship of the Imperial Navy, she had survived dozens of bloody naval battles without a bao ao scratch. Her presence was expected to bring luck to the Unryu, but in war, luck is a finite resource. And today, their luck had run out. As the convoy moved out to sea, the weather deteriorated. A winter storm rolled in, gale force winds and mountainous waves. At first, Captain Coney, she saw this as a good omen. Rough seas and zero visibility meant American reconnaissance planes couldn't spot them. But he was wrong. The storm did blind the American planes, but it also deafened his own escorts. The roar of the waves crashing against the hulls completely masked the sound of the enemy engines lurking below. They had no idea that a ghost had been trailing them for hours. That ghost was the USS Redfish, a Bahlao class submarine of the US Navy. Commanding the ship was Commander Louis D. McGregor, a patient and incredibly aggressive hunter. This was a mismatch in every sense. The Unryu, 17,000 tons, hundreds of guns, carrying over a thousand troops. The Redfish, 1,500 tons, just 80 sailors in a cramped steel tube. If they spotted each other on the surface, the Unryu and her escorts would crush the Redfish in less than a minute. But McGregor had no intention of fighting on the surface. He was playing cat and mouse in the depths. Throughout the afternoon of December 19th, McGregor tracked the Japanese convoy's radar signal. The storm made depth control a nightmare. The sub pitched and rolled, bobbing up and down. At exactly 16.35 hours, dusk began to fall. McGregor risked raising the periscope through the lens, blurred by sea foam, he saw the prize of a lifetime. Not a transport, not a tanker. It was a flat top, a fleet aircraft carrier, the ultimate prey every submarine captain dreams of. The Unryu was moving at 20 knots, her bow smashing through the rough waves. The escort destroyers, blind and deaf from the storm, had no idea the redfish had slipped inside their defensive screen. 
McGregor was in the perfect firing position. He gave the order, his voice cold but decisive. Stand by forward tubes. Fire four. Fire one. Fire two. Fire three. Fire four. Four Mark 23. Torpedoes left the tubes, racing away at 46 knots, leaving white wake trails that were quickly swallowed by the storm. On the Un Rayu's bridge, a lookout screamed. Torpedoes starboard. Captain Kony Shi roared for a hard turn. The massive rudder swung over. The ship listed heavily, groaning under the pressure of inertia. But 17,000 tons of steel, plus hundreds of tons of cargo, made the Un Ryu heavy and sluggish. She was not a speedboat. She could not turn on a dime. The first torpedo slammed into the starboard side, directly under the bridge. Boom! A column of water mixed with black oil shot into the sky, higher than the control tower. The consequences were instant. Boilers ruptured. Main steam line severed. All electrical power died. The giant ship went dead in the water, drifting like a log. But at this point, the disaster was still manageable. An aircraft carrier is designed like a honeycomb with hundreds of watertight compartments. She was wounded. She had lost power, but she was floating. Theoretically, the Un Rayu could hold out for hours, maybe days, enough for the destroyers to drive off the sub and tow her back to port. She wasn't dead yet, but fate would not give her that chance. The second torpedo arrived. This time, the American metal fish did not hit the engine room. It slammed straight into the bow, right into the lower hangar, and this is when the secret weapon became the traitor. The shock wave from the torpedo blast traveled through the hull, slamming directly into the rows of Oka suicide missiles lined up in the hold. 30 warheads, each containing 1.2 tons of high explosive, all detonating at once in a confined space. It wasn't just an explosion anymore. It was physical erasure. Imagine the force of dozens of heavy bombs detonating inside a steel box. The terrifying pressure blew the entire forward flight deck off the ship. The bow of the Un Ryu was ripped open, severed from the hull as if broken by a giant hand. A massive fireball erupted, lighting up the stormy twilight, drowning out even the thunder of the gale. The young Oka pilots, Men who had prepared themselves to die gloriously in the sky, crashing into enemy ships, now died a sudden, anonymous death. They were incinerated in the dark hold by the very weapons they were entrusted with. The ocean rushed into the gaping hole where the bow used to be. Not a leak, but the entire sea pouring in. Inside the ship, it was hell on Earth. Total power loss meant no pumps were working. Fire suppression systems were useless. Thousands of soldiers and sailors were trapped in pitch darkness amidst screaming, twisting metal and freezing water rising to their necks. Captain Kony Shi on the bridge realized the end was sealed. He didn't order to save the ship because there was no ship left to save. The list increased dizzily. 10 degrees, 20 degrees, then 30. In an instant, the ship capsized. No time to lower lifeboats, no time for an orderly evacuation. The American carrier Yorktown, battered at Midway, still floated for three days before sinking. But the Un Ryu was different. From the moment the secret weapons detonated, the massive ship vanished from the surface in just seven minutes. The explosion had shattered its spine, dragging it down so fast that many sailors didn't even realize what was happening before they were sealed tight in a steel coffin. The destroyer Shigu Rei rushed in to help, risking a follow-up attack from the sub. But amidst the violent seas and oil-slicked water, they rescued only 146 men. 1,238 others were left forever at the bottom of the East China Sea. The death of the Un Ryu was not just the loss of a ship. It was the final period for all of Japan's strategic hopes. Let's pose a what-if scenario. What if the Redfish had missed? 
What if the Un Ryu had docked safely in Manila? Then those 30 Oka missiles would have become a true nightmare for the U.S. Navy. Remember, at 1,000 kilometers per hour, anti-aircraft guns of that era could not shoot them down. If 15 hit their marks, 15 American warships would be out of the fight. Thousands of GIs would die. The invasion of Luzon could have been delayed for weeks, even months. It was a real strategic threat. But that threat was neutralized, not by American skill, but by Japanese incompetence. This is the tragedy of criminal resource waste. Japan in 1944 was starving for materials. Every bolt, every steel plate, every liter of oil used to build and fuel the Unryo was the sweat and blood of the nation. That steel could have been used to cast hundreds of tanks or thousands of anti-tank guns to defend the homeland. That oil could have been used for interceptor squadrons fighting the B-29s burning Tokyo. Instead, the Empire poured all its national treasures into a flashy, complex ship, only to use it as a disposable cargo freighter. They forged the sharpest samurai sword, then used it to chop wood. And the result was the sword shattered, and the swordsman lost his life. The wreck of the Unrayu now lies silent somewhere at the bottom of the cold East China Sea. It is an eternal monument to a failed strategy. It reminds us of a brutal lesson of war. Technology, no matter how modern, is useless without logic. You can own the biggest ship, the fastest missile. But if you lack the wisdom to use them, you are only digging yourself a very expensive grave. The Cloud Dragon never had a chance to breathe fire. It was a weapon that destroyed nothing except itself. So what do you think? Was the Oka Bakka bomb project a genius invention ahead of its time? Or a sign of desperate madness from a military that had lost its mind? Was the sacrifice of those suicide pilots meaningful or just useless death? We really want to hear your opinions in the comments. And if you want us to open the classified files and make a dedicated video analyzing the details, operation, and horrifying stories inside the cockpit of this Oka suicide missile. Comment the word Oka below. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe to Fireline so you don't miss the next gritty historical stories. See you next time.